What about going to a therapist makes it taboo? I think it's the idea of, of weakness, reputation, other people finding out in your family's reputation. It's a hard pill to swallow. It makes me, you know, emotional sometimes. I, I try not to bring it into session, that emotion. While I was preparing for this episode, in your bio it says your mission was dispelling mental health myths. Good question. So, so one is what things like, uh, there's one, one myth as well, and we'll add this one too, I think, pertaining to our religious community, is that if sometimes just the act of sharing, just of speaking out loud can be so beneficial. The problem is still there. What is it about talking to someone that has such a positive effect on me? It goes back to, I think, one of the basic needs that we have as, as human beings. One of the things you, you just mentioned was uh, depression. This is a good way for you to know about if you have depression is that if you feel like... And then the immigrant community. What is the number one mental health issue that we're facing? Before we start today's episode, I just wanted to thank you for taking the time out of your day and giving this podcast a listen. And I also wanted to remind you that the only way this podcast will ever grow is with your support and with your help. So subscribe to the podcast, like this video, and now let's get the show started. Welcome aboard Middle East Airlines. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum, Ahmed. How are you? Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. How are you doing? Thank you for uh, coming. Welcome to Not From Here. Now, uh, first of all, I want you to introduce yourself. Mm. But I want you to introduce yourself as if you're looking in the mirror. Who is Ahmed Ahmed? Um, obviously, it's a tough question when you ask someone, you know, who they are and their, their essence, you know, and kind of, uh, you know, I, I used to, a lot of times when people used to ask me, uh, they used to ask me the question, you know, based on your the name of your podcast, not from here. So they used to ask me the question, where are you from? And most of my life, I grew up in the U.S. especially. Um, my first my first reaction was to say I'm from Iraq. Mm. So it took me a while to say to really, I think, accept that I, you know, maybe I'm I'm uh, from the U.S. I'm, I'm in the U.S. I'm I can be considered like an American citizen, let's say. And I'm one of I'm, I'm one of everyone else here. Um, so, so the name of your podcast really resonated with me in that sense. Um, so it took me a while. I think that that had a lot to do with me kind of accepting my, my identity and figuring out who I am really. Um, so, uh, right now in terms of, I guess, as a, as a person, that's, that's where I'm from. Uh, but, uh, I identify mostly as a, as a Muslim, I think just as a Muslim and, uh, um, and uh, and as well as uh, being um, uh, in terms of my profession, I'm a therapist. So uh, um, I see uh, I do you know mental health therapy counseling. So uh, so yeah, that's uh, just kind of briefly. So this is going to be one of those occasions where you're being asked the questions and you're not asking the questions. Exactly, exactly. How did you end up here? You, like you said, you when people ask you where you're from, you said you were from Iraq. Mm -hmm. But how did you end up here originally? Um, <clears throat> so it was, a, it was a long journey, really. So I was uh, I was born in, in Baghdad. Um, my my family's there still, um, very close to them, you know, overseas. Um, we moved to. Uh, I lived in Syria for a couple of years uh, mm -hmm. when I was uh, around seven or so uh, in the Sayyida Zainab area. Um, so I think that's uh, that was a very um, very important part of my life. That's I, I base a lot of kind of uh, who I am on that period, those two years. Uh, SubhanAllah, it's just two years, but it played a, a, a big role for In me. In what way? Uh, like I mentioned, when I when I came here, I think I said from Iraq because I I felt like I I you know that was part of that was my identity. I didn't. I was trying to figure out who I was. Mm -hmm. So I think I kept referring back to. Um, to uh, not specifically Iraq. At that time, I, I referred back mentally to that Sayyidah Zainab area. That's where I learned a lot of, uh, you know, my, my core uh, beliefs about uh, about the world, about uh, my my faith, about Islam, uh, about Quran, about uh, things like that. So, so feeling lost here, coming here in the U.S., I think I kept referring back to not not overtly, but just mentally. I kept referring back to the Sayyidah Zainab. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, time period. So, uh, um, so we stayed there for a couple of years, and then moved here. We moved all over the U.S., different different states, uh, <clears throat> and uh, you know, finally here. I moved to Michigan about uh, 
about four years ago. Oh, very recent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where did you like it most? I think nothing compares to Michigan for me mm -hmm. because, and that's one of the reasons that we came. That's the main reason that we came. I came with my uh, wife and, and uh, had one child at the time. So um, the main reason was this, was, the, was really being more in touch with, with who I am with my identity, with our identities, you know, as, as a family, with our identity as a family. So uh, the, the Muslim community here, the, you know, the, what we, what you get here that you don't really get anywhere else, I think. Being comfortable, uh, you know, having our children be comfortable with, uh, with their names, you know, and, and, uh, and being who they are. Not, you know, being unapologetically Muslim and, and, and Shia as well, specifically in this area. Yeah. How old are you when you moved to the United States? I was nine. Nine? Yeah. Okay, very young. Yes, yes. <clears throat> and it's uh, crazy how even at nine years old, you still refer back to that part of your life, like from mm -hmm. before nine years old. And uh, what made you go into psychology? Because <clears throat> I, I tried to go into psychology. I studied, I minored in psychology, but... It was originally going to be my major and when you know that talk when you have with your parents like mm. hey i want to be a i want to study psychology it was mm. like no like what are you doing you know especially and that's for me mm. and that's like recent yes so how did that even come about to you yeah yeah the 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 parent conversation is interesting yeah because i i, I went into another field at the beginning and then i i just said this is not for me this is not you know it's not you know working out it's not clicking um, and, and what I went back to, what felt most natural was psychology. Yeah. Uh, I took a class in my senior year of high school, mm. psychology elective. So just going into college. And so it stuck with me that I like this, this, this clicked for me. So, uh, you know, uh, so the, the class wasn't necessarily kind of, it was what made it clear, but I think beforehand, I think because of, uh, because of, uh, our, our life stories, I think, really shape what we what we want to do. So I think for me, moving around so much and, and changing locations and um, not being able to really make as many connections as I wanted in right. terms of uh, friendships and things because we kept moving. So those, um, uh, I think I, I became, you know, I, I started kind of observing from the background. I started uh, seeing things, uh, trying to connect the pieces trying to understand you know the world around me trying to understand myself so that's why it, it kind of clicked for me when when i took that class in at the, at the end of uh, the end of high school but uh, like i said when i changed my major my i remember my my father uh, Allah Rahma, uh, he said uh, he kept every time i kept talking to him about psychology and i had changed my major i had told him uh, he used to he used to say uh, you know, when did you change? You didn't tell me. I, said, yeah. no, I kept going through the same story. No, I, I remember I told you this is uh, this is what I'm doing. This is, uh, um, but Alhamdulillah, now uh, I think uh, my mother now is uh, you know sees it as as you know a very closely you know kind of connected to who I am as well. Mm. People around me they they see it as kind of matching. So Alhamdulillah, I feel very uh, um, I feel very blessed and lucky to be able to do something that that uh, that I love as a profession. What connected you to it was the information aspect because that's very interesting like when you think about oh I'm going to understand like how the human mind works and how certain events have uh, an effect on the human or did the social aspect of it uh, kind of uh, attract you to it like talking to people and listening to people's problems what kind of attracted you to it? Um, that's a good question so it's I think both sides kind of work mm -hmm. together. So, uh, so I think in an effort to kind of make sense of the world, I think I was actually just talking before I came here. I was talking with uh, with someone who is, you know, uh, more recently become a kind of like mentor to me, especially in the field as well. Um, and she was saying this. She was saying that uh, she was saying that some of her Muslim colleagues have told her that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala He gives us uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of clients and cases and things that we work, he gives us cases that help us uh, and clients that help us understand ourselves as well. So we learn. So in terms of therapy, it's it's a collaborative process. So so I learn a lot from the clients as well. 
So it's it's not one way. Mm-hmm. And and we, you know, maybe we'll talk a little bit more later about the therapy process, but it's um but but that was kind of one of the things that I wanted is to learn more about myself mm-hmm. and who I am. Um and so this is uh, uh and so this was one of the driving forces for me is to make sense of who I who I was, who I am and um and the world the world around me and 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 people as well so it was it was it was in an effort i think to make sense of everything yeah and to help myself to help others i think to kind of um feel like i'm a contributing part of society that's a very it's a very nice way of thinking about it and uh like recently you hear this a lot everyone says we need to talk about mental health mental health mental health yes what is mental health Mm. Yes, yes, it is. A, it is a trendy topic now, yeah. right? Yeah. So the easiest way to compare, I think, for me to to say it and define it for me is to compare it with physical health. Like we have physical health, we have mental health to uh, to also think about. Mm-hmm. Um, mental health is neglected. Why? Because it's it's not seen. You know, physical symptoms are are there. They're clear. You you know you have sometimes it's clear. Sometimes it's just pain that you can't. Um, that you can't really ignore. Mm-hmm. Mental health, a lot of times we're taught to ignore, to push through, to be, um, to just kind of, uh, to be, to be strong and push through it. Um, so really it's, it's our, our mental and emotional uh, state. It's how we're, uh, uh, it's how we, how we think, how we feel, which leads to, you know, things that we do, that people see uh, in terms of the way that we talk, the way that we, uh, the way that we interact with people, the way that we behave mm-hmm. in, in different kinds of environments. So it's, it's, uh, it's really essential. We, it, it's often ignored. There's a lot of stigma, obviously, in, in our community. There's stigma in other communities as well, not just ours. Uh, so it's something that we're trying to push for here to normalize in our community. You know? What makes it a taboo topic? What about mental health? Or like going to a therapist makes it taboo. Do you think? I think it's the idea of of weakness, mm. the idea of weakness, the idea of um, reputation, the idea of, of other people finding out, of of it tarnishing your reputation, your family's reputation, and you know just uh, as they say, kind of pray it away and just just pray about it and uh, recite Quran or recite Dua and and it'll go away. And just be strong, push through it. And and you're given examples of people who've pushed through it, you know, uh, and people who are okay. Um, a lot of times what's interesting is people go to uh, doctors. A lot of times doctors and, and other professionals hear about mental health problems and not therapists. So I've heard stories from, uh, you know, doctors are main ones, like primary care doctors, other doctors. People confide, confide in doctors and uh, uh, physicians uh, in physical therapists and uh, I've heard, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, people whose profession is not therapy that hear stories about mental health, mm. uh, religious scholars as well. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so anyone but a therapist, because when you go to a therapist, you're immediately you have a mental health problem. You're making it official. Making it official, you have an issue. <laughs> you know, we hear this person's got issues. Yeah. You know, they have issues. So, so they'd rather do people would rather do anything than admit and and go into. Um, the, uh, you know, to admit that they have this mental health issue, and I'm going to go and take the first step and seek it. So, so people who come from our community, from from anywhere really, but from our community, who go into therapy and who come uh, and see a therapist, uh, it really takes a lot, I think, to be yeah. able to just share all these, uh, you know, whatever you're going through. How do you know? How do I know if I have a mental health issue and have to go to therapy? You hear people say everyone needs therapy. Okay, mm-hmm. but does does everyone have to go to a therapist? In your opinion? I think everyone can benefit from seeing a therapist. Okay. But um, whether everyone needs to go see a therapist, that's, that's you know, we can argue about that. But I think, um, I think that's up to the person to, to figure out. So that goes back to your, the first part of your question is, how do we know if we need to go see someone? How, do, how can you tell? This is helpful for you and helpful for uh, people that you know in your life, right? So, so um so there's clear signs. There's sometimes signs that other people notice around you that you don't notice. Mm-hmm. They notice you're acting different. Um, and that's why it's, it's, it's good to have a 
close group of uh, friends, family, because they can tell you when you're acting different. Mm. Something is off. You know, what's good? There's not like you. What's going on? Sometimes that can be because of you know something that's uh, uh, you know like a, a life stressor, something that's happened. Um, maybe a big life change, or maybe it's uh, it's just something you know day to day that you're seeing differently that triggers something inside you, and and it's it's all you know so related. We can have things that just pop up from our childhood all of a sudden. So right. um, so there's things. So to put it simply, there's things that can affect you in terms of, uh, that can affect us in terms of uh, our functioning in, you know, at school, at, at work, uh, socially, uh, in, in all these kinds of ways. Mm-hmm. So when we see that, it, that it's affecting our functioning, like we're not performing as well, um, when we're not maybe turning in assignments on time if you're in school or, or um, you know, with issues like procrastination, these kinds of issues, or when it's social, when it's when you're maybe avoiding talking to people or when you feel like, um, you know, uh, people see you a certain way, let's say, or um, a, a lot of it is, is uh, a lot of it is about, uh, you know, the, the theories that I subscribe to, a lot of them, a lot of it says it's about uh, our thoughts. That's, that's what I subscribe mm-hmm. to is a lot of it is about how we think of the world and the perspective that we have. Mm-hmm. Um, so, that, so that's one side when it's affecting you right now, when it's, you can't function. But there's people who function, people who, who function and who go through life uh, on paper, everything looks fine. But they're, but they're suffering. Yeah. They're going through something. They're going through you know, depression or anxiety or whatever it is. But they're doing it in silence. A lot of times it's, it's because of maybe the shame that they feel like it's going to bring to them or others if they share. Yeah. Uh, and uh, a lot of times it's because they say that it, you know, it's, fi- it's been fine so far. I've been able to deal with it. Uh, and, um, and so I'll just keep dealing with it. It mm-hmm. becomes a part of our identity, actually. We think it's a part of our identity, but it's something that if we deal with, if we focus on, we can, um, we, it, it can help us to reach really our full potential. Mm, I see what you're saying. Mm. How would you, how would the approach differ if someone from Iraq came, mm-hmm. walked into your office, and someone from America or mm. like even let's say they're both Iraqi, but one lives in Iraq, one lives his whole life here. Mm-hmm. How does the approach differ? If it does differ at all? One aspect would be the language, of course. Mm-hmm. So, so I do have some clients that I that I have sessions with in Arabic. Um, so as soon as you have sessions in Arabic, that that changes the dynamic a little bit because. Um, it's interesting because in Arabic it becomes uh, uh, it becomes less formal in some way. Mm. You know, uh, I don't want to say therapy is formal, but but it's uh, it becomes more. Um, they see it as, and they're used to seeing something that someone who's just friendly, who's a friend. Yeah. Uh, and 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 I want to stress that a therapist is not a friend, <laughs> so we have to make that clear. Sometimes there's some uh, some people who think that. Um, so you know it's a complicated relationship really it's it's a, it, like i said it's a collaborative relationship so it's a hard pill to swallow that yeah. the person that you feel maybe most comfortable talking to is your therapist and we associate people that we're comfortable talking to to our close family or like close friends mm-hmm. but i can't look at you as someone that's close to me you can look at me as someone close to you as a as a, as a client but it's it's not a friend yeah it's someone who's helping you on your journey mm. of, of self-discovery, let's say. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that can be one of the most important relationships in our lives, is, a, is if you have a good therapist, if you have a good rapport, a good relationship with your therapist, that can be one of the most important relationships in your life, actually, yeah. because that can unlock a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, kind of things inside you, a lot of, uh, it can be the key to unlocking a lot of uh, your potential and how you see the world, how you can improve other relationships in your life. So. I wouldn't say that you can't see them as close, but it's not exactly a friend. Yeah. The reason it's very specific is that if it becomes a friend, then a friend is a two-way thing, and 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 I'm looking to gain something from you as well. So, like I said earlier, I I still gain something, and I I gain a lot mm-hmm. uh, from from clients about my own issues, about uh, you know about uh, things around me, about how I see uh, the world, and and um, uh, you know and, and problems and all all kinds of things, but. Um, but but in therapy, it's a collaborative process to help the client, 
So we're both working together to help the client. Right. Yeah. So I'm not going to make it about me. Yeah. I share things about myself sometimes, but I have to be careful with not making the session about me. Of course. Yeah. And continuing on the the differences in approach between someone that lives in Iraq and someone that lives here. Yes. Uh, language is one of them. Mm-hmm. What's like uh, talking to, <clears throat> talk because pe- do you visit Iraq often? I haven't since I left now, oh, but, inshallah, wow. but inshallah soon. Okay, because uh, interacting with people there, it's um, it's I see it personally as different than interacting with people here. Like mm-hmm. the, we live in kind of two different worlds. So I was just curious about how you would s- approach someone that lives there versus someone that lives here. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so like we said, language is one. Um, the the other ways. Um, so, so looking at um, the approach, we, we have to, sometimes there is, when, when what you learn in school, what you come out with, and I think there's a lot of fields, not just therapy, what you come out with is a certain textbook approach to a lot of things. And I think when you, when you get on the field, when, when I started doing therapy with and seeing actual clients, I saw a little bit of a... Uh, uh, a difference because I tried to be, you know, very uh, structured, maybe overly structured in terms of how I wanted to approach things. But that takes away from how I'm, you know, what I'm giving the client right. and what I'm allowing them to do. Of course. So one of the one of the things that I learned really is to have some flexibility and to see what approach works best with them. So, so I don't think it it differs entirely just because they're from Iraq or they're from Lebanon or from anywhere else. Uh, necessarily because they're from that place, from that area. Yeah. I think I've had, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, one of the things that we see really is that despite the backgrounds of, of the clients that I'm seeing, you know, it, it's, it's, it gives you a perspective of how, you know, as, as human beings, how we're really so similar. Mm. We see a lot of, we, we, we like to point the finger at other people. We like to see differences. But in reality, <clears throat> subhanAllah, we have the same kinds of issues. We have the same, uh, you know, kinds of issues that we deal with. About I hear issues about people dealing with their families, uh, with friends, struggling at work, um, and it makes me, you know, emotional sometimes. I, I try not to bring it into session that emotion, but it makes me emotional because I, I think of that that aspect that you know this client is so different from me uh, in terms of their background, their religion, but we have, uh, you know, it, it's it's the. Uh, it, it's the the compassion, I think, the mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has put in us that we're able to connect with people in that way. Yeah. That we see them as um, that we see them as uh, as just human beings, you know, who are struggling. And that's why whoever comes in and sits in front of me as a client, I, I, I give them the same attention regardless of where they're from. Yeah. And uh, and alhamdulillah, that's just that, that's a really um, that's something that's really invaluable, I think, to have. So you you basically you resonate with them hmm. as yeah. different as you guys are. The, they walk in maybe with some problems that you're going with personally in your in your life. Yeah, yeah. While I was preparing for this episode, uh, in your bio it says your mission was dispelling mental health myths. Mm-hmm. So I'm sold on your mission. <laughs> so what what are some mental health myths that we should know of? It's a good question. Um, so, so one is what we mentioned earlier that if you have a mental health issue, then you're a, then you're weak. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's completely that's completely false because of because, uh, like I said, if you if you come to therapy, then you're then you're brave because you're admitting that you have an issue. Yeah. You're admitting that as as a human being, you're not perfect. You have faults. Um, and, and it's not necessarily about faults or not, but it, but you have things that you want to work on. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the things. Um, things like, um, you know, mental uh, people who have mental health uh, conditions or issues are uh, crazy. Let's say that they, that word is used a lot, yeah. uh, and we've had some talks in the community about that as well, uh, about calling people who have mental health issues crazy. Uh, it's kind of like a blanket statement for all kinds of issues, and you know, as as I got. You know more into the field, and as, and just as I got older, really as well, you start seeing that, uh, you know, Subhanallah, you have a lot of people 
that you used, they used to call uh, strange or crazy or weird, yeah. all these kinds of things. Marid. Marid, yes, as well. <clears throat> but in reality, they have a struggle that they're going through. When you can identify it, you can, you can, so when we call them this, when we call them all these names, we're, we're taking away from, from what makes them unique. We're taking away from their humanity, really. We're mm-hmm. labeling them as something. We don't understand this thing, but, uh, and because of that, I'm going to label it as whatever suits me best, and I'll put them in this corner, I'll put them in this box. But naming, uh, but, but actually understanding what they have yeah. can help us to, uh, can help us to put that humanity back in them, that they are humans like us. They just have something that they're struggling with. We are just maybe able to hide our struggles better than them. Right. Uh, and the second part is that uh, we're able to uh, to help them as well. Sometimes you know some some things that were seen as as uh, issues back you know back in the day back when uh, in, in past generations are not as are not the same types of issues now. You don't have to go into like an asylum you know as or like a psychiatric hospital for everything. You can deal with things. So. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of issues like that. There's one one myth as well uh, pertaining to our um, we'll add this one too. I think pertaining to our religious community is that if you have a mental health condition, then you're not religious, or maybe uh, Allah is angered with you, uh, or maybe you're not. Uh, yes, you're not. Uh, you're not a. Um, yeah, you, it shows something about your faith. Yeah. So that's a problem for a lot of reasons because one, it pushes people away from religion. As well, do you have people actually walk in and and like are scared of that? Like they tell you, they talk to you about that. At which point? The if they're scared, they're scared of the judgment. If I come to you, it means I'm not religious or I'm not faithful. They're not scared of the judgment. They're they feel guilty talking about it a lot of times. Okay. <clears throat> There's a lot of guilt, I think talking about it they, there's guilt about how their families can see them about how they see them themselves about their relationship with with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, so in, in that sense I, that, that can um, that can impede a lot of things so so we can tie this as well with the question from before about what is mental health this is this is one way that it's it's uh, mental health uh, symptoms can be seen. Hmm. Uh, in terms of how we live our daily lives. So so working on our mental health can help us spiritually as well. They can work both ways. Having a spiritual connection can help us with, uh, can be a great, one of the best coping methods really, because it gives us all this, this amazing perspective on life. It gives, us, uh, it gives us a sense of purpose. It gives us a lot of these things um, and, and ways to cope in the moment, you know, to reframe and to change how we think about things. Um, <clears throat> and then also the other way around is that if we work on our mental health, if we have this guilt, if we have guilt about, <clears throat> and this is something I, 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 you know, I like to talk about a lot, is that if we have guilt about not doing what we need to do to be, you know, to be, let's say, good Muslims, yeah. let's call it, then that can really uh, be counterproductive. I'm guilty. I feel guilty that I'm not a good Muslim. And so therefore, I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to fast. So it's counterproductive, it doesn't yeah. work. Uh, so working on what those negative thoughts, those kind of distorted thoughts, we can call them as well, can help us to become better Muslims. And that can in turn help us to become better... Humans. Humans. In general. To work, yes, to, to be better for ourselves and for others around us. Yeah. So it, it, it all works together. It's all, it's all you know, it's... It's, um, it's one machine, it's tied in. Yeah. All, all the different parts of us working together in your practice and the immigrant community what is the number one mental health issue that we're facing like i said i think a lot of it is similar to you know just across the, the you know across the board it's similar between you know whether people are from immigrant backgrounds or or not people a lot of times have the same types of issues um but from 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 our community, we have a lot of uh, people who have who come with depression. They come, you know, with 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 depression. There's a lot of people who come with anxiety. There's social anxiety. There is, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder, so OCD. Um, Are there hidden problems that maybe we 
we're not attentive of, but they're happening in your office. Like you're being exposed to them, but we're not being exposed to them. That's a good question. Uh, I think a lot of it is um, a lot of issues that people come with are things that they we talked about the, the the guilt we talked about the shame as well and 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 how how that may look on them on their reputation on their families so a lot of times it's issues that they hide from their families um, and um, they can be issues of of maybe uh, maybe maybe putting on uh, a certain act in front of others so not fully being ourselves mm. because of uh, uh, you know because of for example uh, you know the backlash that we're going to get from from people from our community and I've and I've had clients like that I've had Muslim clients who've um, who've not not all of them have hidden sometimes they've they've tried to face some of these issues with their parents for example if they don't have like a clear understanding of religion of islam uh and they want to do something that's against that they're going to have backlash from their families from their mm -hmm. communities a lot of times they will so sometimes they i mean it can happen in, in two ways sometimes they can uh they can just start doing things on their own secretly uh, in terms of uh, you know whatever it is in terms of uh, um, anything really sinful let's say and uh, other times it can be in, in front of uh, it can cause an issue where there's a, a divide now between them and their families yeah um, other other times it's it's maybe they they come they're they're open with these problems and because of the backlash they they fall in but on the inside, they they don't really fully believe in in, in you know in, in let's say in Islam itself, and mm. not fully in Islam, but in terms of the the being observant Muslims and yeah. practicing Muslims. Um, so uh, so I think that that says a lot about uh, about the need to have discussions with our families and with people we trust, and maybe having others help us if we feel like our maybe uh, our our other extended family help us if we have problems doing that with our parents um but but yeah so those are kind of uh, kind of the, some of the issues how bad do you think it's going to have on them internally when they suppress that part of, part of their identity yes so that's that's a great that's a great follow up to that because uh, because that's not healthy um uh, i think there's layers to this question because uh It's not healthy to do that. It, there's a difference between, I think, openly talking about everything, all your issues, which is maybe the, the trend now, uh, the trend in social media is to talk about everything. Everything. Everything, you talk about everything and, and share all your perspectives, which on the, on the one hand is good because it gives people uh, something to relate to, that they're not alone, it normalizes some things. But on the other hand, it can normalize some things that are maybe, um, that are that are not great to normalize in terms of you know uh, values that we have as, as Muslims uh, and in our community specifically. So, um, so in terms of suppressing, in terms of suppressing, it's good to share, but we have to be careful who we share with and how much we share. I think. How much we share, and how we share, what 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 kind of uh, what tool we use to share. So we don't have to share everything on social media. We can share. Uh, it still counts if we share with uh, with our close uh, close circle. I mean that sometimes that's all we need. Yeah. Um, but I think it's in all cases it's important to share. In all cases it's important not to suppress, not to bottle up things. Yeah. Because when we bottle up things, when when we suppress, we, it's going to come out somehow. It's going to come out somehow. You know, I've had uh, uh, this way of looking at things where if you don't take care of yourself. Uh, if you don't take care of yourself um, by by understanding, you know what your what your mind needs, what your body needs, then eventually it's going to come out in ways and at times that you that you didn't want, that you didn't expect. Mm -hmm. They're not convenient. So taking care of ourselves, this goes to the issue of of you know self care 
as is also a kind of a trendy topic as well. But it's it's something about uh, you know caring for ourselves, and one of the ways of doing that is being able is having someone that we can talk to. That doesn't have to be a therapist. It can be a parent, it can be uh, an uncle or an aunt, maybe it can be a sibling, a friend, anyone who we're close to who we feel like we can share with. Yeah. Sometimes just the act of sharing, just of speaking out loud, alone can be uh, can be so beneficial. Gets you to kind of uh, kind of brainstorm and think and connect the dots and think about how to approach things. But suppressing definitely is not healthy. Yeah, Ahmed, I have a question on that. Okay, let's say I have a problem. Okay, mm-hmm. I go to my my close friend, and I tell him, "Hey, I'm going through one, two, three. Mm-hmm. The problem is still there. What about what is it about talking to someone and just letting it out of my system?" that has such a positive effect on me? It goes back to, I think, one of the basic needs that we have as, as human beings. And that's the need to be, to be heard, to mm. be seen, to be understood, to feel like someone out there is validating. We, we, need, we need people to validate um, what we're going through. Uh, not uh, again with all these things there's there's you know not everything we don't need people to validate we don't feel, uh, you know we shouldn't feel like we need people to uh, so that we feel valued right there's a difference right we don't we don't we shouldn't base our value on other people um, but we do need to feel validated as human beings if you go if you live your life uh, feeling like you're ignored like your issues don't matter like you are not uh, worthy of being listened to, mm-hmm. then that's going to have an effect. So, so, so again, if we so if we look at it again from a um, um, let's say, let's look at it again. Let's look at it as well. If we if we tie in the religious aspect as well, religiously, it's you know we say that we compl- you know co- we should not complain too much. It, it's it's you know the, one of the signs of a of a believer is that the their problems are with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Right. But I think there's a healthy balance. I think it doesn't have to be complaining and, and despairing from, from, our, uh, from our lives and our existence if we just share a basic you know, human struggle that we're going through. Um, of course, we should, we should you know, and I say this, as, of course, as a Muslim. I don't, uh, by the way, say all these thoughts exactly as I'm saying them now when I have, a, you know, in session, especially if the client is not religious themselves you know or they're not you know they you don't have to take that into consideration of course yeah so if it works for them but 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 you know speaking with our you know people from our community i think um i think it's it's fine and it's it's not just fine it's it's a necessity to speak about our problems with other people mm-hmm. um uh but l- like you said you know how much we share and what we share and how how we approach that that issue is uh, there's a there's a way of doing it that's going to be healthier um and it's going to be better for you eventually. You don't want to say something how much we share, for example. You don't want to say, you know, something where you're in the height of your issue that you're going to regret later. You right. know, why did I overshare? And who we're sharing to. I think a lot of people, I was going to use the word naive because I can't think of a better one. But sharing with like complete, like you sometimes get strangers telling you too much information. And like, okay, maybe I'm not going to do anything with this information, but if if it was someone else and they had bad intentions towards you, it could get, get really bad. So mm. I, I agree 100% with That's what good you're they're saying. saying them to you then. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. One of the things you, you just mentioned was uh, depression. And uh, that's like another word that, that gets thrown around a little too much. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how do I know if I'm actually depressed or not? Because... A lot of a lot of these young kids would, would are going to say uh, they're going to feel a little bit sad. Maybe their parents uh, f- forbade them from doing a specific thing, and now they're depressed, and mm. now they're uh, like uh, they feel handcuffed and whatever. What 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 is it about depression that we should know of too? So there's two extremes. Yeah, there's people who uh, parents who say no, my child's not depressed. They don't have anything. They don't have any problems. They're just they just want attention. Um, that's one side, or not just parents, but other people yes. around, the, um, if we, our friends and others. Uh, and then uh, the other side is that um, you know the other the other uh, 
extreme of that is that maybe people who say um, who say that everything is depression. Mm. So we don't again speaking about the word uh, validation about being you know validating people's uh, feelings. We don't want to invalidate people's feelings and say no, you don't have depression, get over it. If they feel depressed, that's how they're describing it. Maybe it's not clinical depression, but they're describing mm. it that way. Okay. But if we look at it objectively, you know what is depression? So. Uh, a lot of times depression is thought of as sadness. It can be sadness, but it's also, it's, it's more than sadness. It's a feeling of being numb and being, you know, not, re- not really feeling, not getting pleasure from things, just going through the motions. Sometimes having difficulty even going through the motions, like not being able to get out of bed, feeling tired and, and lethargic and, um, and, and fatigued all the time. Um, easily fatigued. Uh, there's, uh, uh, things like um, uh, things like having a low mood, so feeling like you're not really uh, again like not getting pleasure out of things. Um, things this is a, this is a good way for you to know about if you have depression is that if you feel like you're not really participating in a lot of things that you used to participate in before, um, it can be a lot of things. People are not interested in if they used to play video games, they're not interested in that anymore. If they used to play sports, they're not interested in that. They're, uh, they become withdrawn, they isolate, they're not really, in, you know, interacting with others as much. Um, they can oversleep, they can uh, stay in bed all day, they don't want to get out of bed. Sometimes they do get out of bed to go to work and to, to complete, you know, their, their tasks and all these things, but they really have to pull themselves out. It, it's not, it's difficult. Mm. Uh, they, there, there's issues of feeling worthless, maybe feeling like you're like you're not good enough feeling hopeless um all these kinds of things of course there's also feelings of uh you know being suicidal as well having suicidal thoughts and ideation that's on the extreme end of the depression yes yes uh so then when 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 we look at that we try to look at you know what protective factors the client has or the person has can be anyone in our lives doesn't have to be a client uh and how we can uh help them you know what they can do to stay safe in that case um so i'm i'm pretty sure a lot of people listening are going to relate to a lot of those individual points yeah. that you said and i'm going to say something like this is a personal story is a lot of the things you said there was a few years back where i used to feel a lot of those things that you said but a cha- i changed i did was sleep a little i slept a little earlier i woke up a little earlier Mm -hmm. i woke up and went to the gym and then all of a sudden it didn't even take that long where almost all all the symptoms that you just described Mm -hmm. were were just left Mm -hmm. out the window Mm -hmm. and i thought at the time that i was depressed i'm like maybe am i depressed but just that very small change changed all of that for me how much do you think people are how many small changes do you think people are away from from getting from losing all those symptoms you know like how much how because with depression i think a lot of people think that there's nothing that they can do about it so you're the, you're an expert you can tell us what are the small things that we can do that might enhance that that our mood or take those symptoms out of our life yeah those, that's a great example that's a great example that you gave uh so that's you took a behavioral approach mm-hmm. you said let me just change a few things in my life and let me uh a few behaviors uh and you were able to pinpoint i'm going to sleep earlier i'm going to get better sleep i'm going to go to the gym i'm going to do you know a b and c um so it depends really one of the best ways of uh overcoming depression or or uh overcoming these these symptoms is uh what you what you just described is is uh, having taking a behavioral approach so uh, not even looking not not focusing too much on the thoughts we, we, um, that's one aspect that's one way we can we'll, we'll get to that maybe but focusing more on what you can do so like we said a lot of times when you're depressed you don't want to do anything mm-hmm. you don't feel like doing anything but in spite of that going and doing something anyway and uh, in your case, like going to the gym, being just kind of exercising, being active, 
that gives you a sense of uh, fulfillment, maybe a sense of like you're accomplishing something. Mm-hmm. Uh, sleeping better that that definitely affects uh, that definitely affects how we feel. Uh, so making these small changes can have a, a huge uh, effect. Sometimes it can take more. Sometimes it can take uh, maybe specifically lo- doing these things. Uh, these are always recommended. Right. And especially if it's if it's severe depression, the main focus is not going to be the, the the person or the client is not going to be able to focus on how can I change these thoughts, how can I change how I'm thinking about this situation or that situation. Mm-hmm. The main thing that we that we tend to start with is the behavior. Okay. Changing the things that you changed. Sometimes that's enough. Like in your case, it was enough. Yeah. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you need something else. You need maybe to, uh, uh, maybe if you're withdrawn from others, maybe engaging more socially, right. uh, changing the way that you think about things, reframing. Uh, you know, those kinds of things can be can be very helpful. So yeah. it's it's subjective. It depends on the person. Yeah, but like even I, like looking back at it now, I don't think it was depression. Like it's, I don't want to get into the neuroscience of it, but it came from like seeing how the body reacts when you sleep a little earlier, and then what happens to in your brain when you go work out, and how that has an effect on the whole day. Mm-hmm. And so, I'm trying to say is, is all of it categorized as depression? Because I don't think I was depressed. I think I was just doing the wrong things. Yes, yes. So, uh, so it's not all clinical depression. Yeah. So it's not all going to meet the criteria that gives you the diagnosis of depression, of clinical depression. Uh, but you can be depressed. So, so being depressed is is having some of those symptoms. You can have some of them and not all. Mm-hmm. So maybe you were in a low mood for a few days. Maybe you had. So you're not necessarily. It may help you to think of it as <clears throat> as I was depressed or or it may not. So in that in that case, if you're just feeling low, despite what you call it, if you're feeling low, then you can have you know you take some of the approaches that you took okay or or change uh, a lot of times it can be it can be deeper. it can it can be deeper where it can be people with um, it, that they've gone through issues all their lives and it's about their beliefs about who they are. Mm-hmm. They have these core beliefs about who they are, about how people view them, about how they see things, about their self. They'll, they have constant low, you know, low self-esteem yeah. throughout their lives. That can be uh, more enduring. Maybe exercise alone is not going to help that. Yeah. You know, with your, it can help though. It can yeah. help. It's not to belittle that. It can help a lot. But what I'm trying to say is that there are different levels. They can all be depression, but maybe it's not to the degree of clinical depression. Mm. Okay, so it's a spectrum more than a yes or no yes, kind of thing. Yes. Um, as a therapist, you're talking to people all day, you're listening to all these problems. How hard is it to not think of these problems when you go back home? Because an average human, I, maybe my friend tells me something, and then it's stuck in my head all day, I'm thinking about his problem, like, man, what he's going through. Let's say, on average, can we say like five you see five people a day. Is that yeah. safe to say? About yeah. At least five people a day. And then how do you make sure you don't go home thinking about all these five people's problems? Um, so, so there's a balance here because I have to have the empathy to, to work with the client when they're with me. You have to empathize with them. You have to put yourself in their shoes as much as possible to see where they're coming from and to see how you can uh, how you can help them how you can help them to help themselves mm. you have to be there you, uh, and they're going to notice they're going to see if you're not there not just in terms of your attention but yeah. in terms of if your emotion is not if you're not there if you're not feeling them um, I think I've gotten better over the years of not taking that with me yeah, because I'm I'm content that I'm doing my best while the client's with me. If something pops up later for me in terms of I think of something that can help them, then I think then I, you know, I I approach it that way. But I if but I know very well that if I do take these problems with me, I know how much it's going to affect me and I know I can get burned out. Yeah. And I know that it's going to affect how I approach them the next time maybe or I, how I can see other clients. Yeah. So it's it's something that I've built over the years that alhamdulillah I can I can I can focus on other things when I'm outside of 
work. Yeah. I can give my all when I'm in session, but I can focus on other things outside. And it's about building healthy boundaries as well. That That's really kind of what we're talking about as well. How, how many years have you been in practice? <clears throat> since um, since 2017. Mm. Yeah. Through the through these years, have you had one patient that stuck with you that you couldn't get out of your head even after you left the office? Um, there's uh, I, I won't go into too much detail, but there was one client that I was only able to see once, mm. only one session, and that was that's never happened to me before. Um, but I mentioned that my father had passed away. Yes. I, uh, uh, so uh, he was, you know, he was sick towards towards the end of his life. So this client who came in had a lot of uh, uh, almost the exact same issue that my father had. So I knew that I couldn't work with with him mm. uh, at the time. And I remember I went to my supervisor and I just told her right away, I don't think I can do this. And I knew that would be, I, I knew that would stick with me. Um, and that's important to know. It's important to figure that out about yourself. That that you know this is going this is going to be something that um, that is more than just you're not going to see this person as just a client. You're going to see them as uh, you're going to have this um, kind of uh, they're going to resemble someone else in your life. You're going to see them. You're going to maybe react to them in a different way. So. I, I stayed away from that one. I knew I knew to stay away from that one because I knew it would be you know bring a lot of emotion. Um, but other than that, uh, I've had others. I've had others over the years um, who have stayed with me um, in 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 one way or another. Ones I think that I can identify with as well personally. Um, so, for example, if, if, if it's someone who, uh, let's say they're going through, let's say if I have a client who's in a similar uh, kind of uh, case to mine in terms of having a family, having children, and uh, they're going through something in their life, sometimes those stick with me because it, it gets me to see that, you know, it's, it's very, everything is so delicate, you know, we have to really take care of these things or else we're gonna right. we're gonna lose them so those kinds of cases I think stick with me a little bit more than others because I see how um, I see how you know uh, how I can you know how anyone can be in that situation yeah how I, everything can turn upside down I have to just be I have to be careful mm. um, yeah but it's hard going back to that patient that you saw only one time it's hard because even thinking about it it's so easy to just be like, oh, he has the same issue as my dad. I miss my dad. I, let me talk to him. Let's see how he's feeling. So it, it takes a lot to to say like, no, I, I can't see this person. It does, yeah, and and it's a it's a judgment call, I think, at that point because it's it's uh, whether you know what can be what is best for the client. Yeah. If I'm not going to be, you said, you know, we were talking about obviously having the boundaries and having, uh, we know what are you going to take away with you. So. If I come sit in session and the whole time I'm thinking about myself and about my struggles and what I went through, that's not going to be helpful for of the course. client. Yeah, of course. So 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 from that perspective. Um, I always uh, have this thing where let's say we had this conversation and I'm thinking about what I asked and what you answered. And then I'll come up with maybe uh better follow-ups in my head does that ever happen to you like you have a conversation with uh, one of your patients and then after the session ends maybe you're taking your notes and you'd be like oh i should have uh, i should have intervened here does that ha happen a lot during therapy yeah it does happen yeah yeah but those are the th kinds of things that i also try not to focus on too much not mm -hmm. not to kind of regret things that i do <clears throat> and just to learn because there's always going to be a, a next session Except when there's not an accession, you know, and they're when they're when they are done with treatment, but um, <clears throat> those maybe will have more regrets if they're done. And then, you know, I say if they're, you know, the clients, uh, I'm not seeing the clients anymore, and uh, and I say, did I really do the best that I could? Mm. Those maybe I I see more. If I have an accession with them, then I can always improve and you know what I'm doing if I feel like there's an issue, uh, and I consult a lot with with you know colleagues and. Uh, other therapists, if I need to, about cases, 
uh, and, and I think that's a very healthy thing to do. <clears throat> but, but in terms of when, when they're done with treatment, I, ask, I do ask myself a lot, um, did I do the best that I could with that person? Um, what is the reason they left? Mm. There's a lot of reasons that clients stop therapy. Some of them is because they're, they're done with treatment. Some is because sometimes issues, let's say with insurance or something like that, um, life issues happen, all kinds of issues. One of them I th- that I think about and I feel sometimes guilty for is, was it me? You know, mm-hmm. was it me? I, I, I do think of that. Did I do something that offended them? Did I do something that, that, that hurt them? Um, did I not approach this in the, in the best way? Sometimes it's been the case where I ask myself, I figure out later after speaking and, and consulting with others that maybe this was an issue that was about me, that I, um, <clears throat> that I had, um, maybe I, I saw everything in, in, in completely the wrong way, let's say. Yeah. And, um, one way that I that I've been that that I've actually looked at therapy and and um, uh, you know someone has recommended to me as well one of my supervisors is that <clears throat> we see therapy as a kind of journey where I'm walking with the client and I'm challenging them and I'm helping guide them yes but I don't necessarily know exactly where they're going mm. they know they know where they will need to be but I, I'm I'm helping guide them my job is to help them figure out what is good for them and what is not and that's not by me telling them what's good and what's not for them because that a lot of times that's subjective Mm. i don't know exactly what they're going through despite them sharing maybe their whole life with me i I still don't know when they leave the session how they're interacting with the world how they're approaching things so i i never i try try not to ever be directive unless it's a safety issue or something like that abuse or or those kinds of things but i try never to be directive i try to it's it's very delicate where i try to just help guide them to where they want to go yeah um so to think of that you know those are one of the that's one of the cases that i thought of um, and every time that someone tells me like i'm consulting with someone like a supervisor or someone else and we talk about something like that i think wow did i was i completely misleading them you know the whole time and it's, it's never the case where I'm completely misleading them, you know, I, I, um, it's never to that degree, but it, I, do guilt, I do get a lot of guilt from that, mm. that they're, they, they're coming to me, <clears throat> trusting me, they're putting... Very vulnerable. They're vulnerable. They're, they're being open with me. It's hard to be vulnerable with people, right? So they're coming, they're trusting me. And and looking at it from that sense, that that's for me when I when I look at it from that sense, that that's a privilege for me because they're they're able to sit in front of me and share all these things with me. So it hits me really hard when I see that maybe I in some way let them down or in some way I misled them yeah. inadvertently, not never consciously or you know intentionally. Um, but what I try to do is just you know say that this is something. Eventually, I come you know. When I'm able to think about it, eventually I say that this is part of learning and I'm improving for them and for for others. And there is no really way to pinpoint exactly why they left, correct? No, no, yeah. unless they tell you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. And I think with therapy, a lot of the time, it's, it's just like any other relationship. Um, let's say you're getting to meet someone. Maybe you're a good person, they're a good person that just doesn't work out and you're not yeah. right for each other. So... You have to depart. So I think a lot of it could be that as well, right? Definitely. There can, there can be yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Alhamdulillah, I, I, I haven't had... Um, it can be a lot of different cases. But uh, in terms of what you're describing is that that relationship that you have, the the rapport that you have with the, with the client, the therapist and the client, that's actually the number one predictor of how well therapy is going to go. Mm. So it's not how skilled the therapist is necessarily. It's not how uh how much they know and all the techniques that they know the biggest predictor is the relationship so if from the beginning we don't have that rapport then no matter what i say and and how much uh you know uh wisdom i can give them and it's not really wisdom it's just you know um it's never going to 
uh, stick, mm. you know. Um, and again, I don't really mean wisdom. I yeah, mean, yeah. The, you know, the, the approach. But, um, uh, but, but yeah, so, so it's, it's the, the rapport. So a point that I want to make here, though, is that a lot of people get tired after one or two therapists. Um, a lot of times it takes, it, it, can, take a, it can take a while until you, you find the right one. So yeah. you have the right connection. And that's the same, uh, you, you know, going back to mental health and physical health. When you're going to, for, physical, for your physical health, when you're going to see a doctor, um, if you see a bad doctor, let's say, or a doctor that you don't connect with, that you feel like is, you know, uh, not connecting with you, you are not just not you're, you're not going to just stop seeing doctors all your life right you're, right you're of course gonna, you have to you have to so with therapists the same thing if you feel like you need to see a therapist uh for any reason then fi- then then it's worth it to keep looking it's first of all it's worth it to keep uh to keep up with the sessions th- that you have with your therapist to try at least a few sessions and give give that a chance uh because sometimes it does take a few sessions but the, on the, but on the other hand, it's also if you don't work with that therapist, then I would suggest being direct with them and saying, you know, I just, you know, I'm not feeling like it's working for me right now, and maybe they can help lead you in the right direction as well in terms of seeing someone else, or you can see someone else on your own. Yeah. But it's I don't think it's ever a solution to just say, you know, like we said with the doctor example, I'm just not going to see anyone anymore. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Is uh like uh, going to therapy and insurance complicated? No, it it can be it can be, but it's um, no. If you if you find the place, if you if you look online, uh, one of the best ways right now to look is to go to um, uh, a website called Psychology Today, and there you can search by therapist, you can search by psychiatrist for like uh, you know a medical doc, uh, mm-hmm. psychiatric doctor for for medication things like that. Uh, and others, other professionals, and you can look by your area. You can look by insurance. You can look by their uh, religion as well. All these kinds of things. Oh, okay. So it makes it easy. Yeah. Um, what can people do in their day to day life to make sure that the people closest to them are the people closest to them's mental health problems are assessed properly? By, by their friends. So you're my friend. How can I make sure that your mental health is okay? Like just stuff that I can do day to day or when I see you, when we meet up. Uh, I think it's it's going back to what we said earlier. It's just seeing if they're acting different. Okay. Yeah. It's just seeing if they're, and, and as a friend, you're maybe in the best position to do that. Mm-hmm. Better because you see them more than parents. They tell you more than your, their parents. Of course. Most of the time more than other people so uh so if you see that they're acting differently if they're not like participating in things that they liked before if mm-hmm. they are more withdrawn if they're more if they're if they're uh, quieter all these kinds of things uh those are signs okay but then it becomes about how you approach them of course then you have to be careful with how you approach them and not being too aggressive exactly no. yeah exactly letting them talk Yes, exactly, exactly. So yeah, I'm 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 a big proponent of of listening and active listening and yeah. and giving people a chance to to speak, uh, and to uh, and to really uh, to really focus on what they're saying, and not on what you're gonna say next yeah. when they're done with that. One of the biggest, uh, I'm gonna call it a problem. One of the biggest problems I I pay attention to during a gathering or even when i'm talking to someone and this kind of makes me not want to talk anymore is i'm coming to ahmed as my friend and i'm telling you about something that just something that went on in my 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 daily life and then you cut me off mid-sentence and tell me about what happened to you even if it's related even if it's relatable but you cut it off and you tell me how that same thing happened to you three weeks ago or mm. whatever. Mm. And, and and it happens. I started realizing it a while ago and I started looking for it in conversations. Mm. So if we're sitting five people and everyone's talking and someone says something that they that they're going through, I would wait and I'm I'm like, someone's about to say something. Yeah. And and when you start looking for it, it happens way more than you think mm. a lot wow. and uh 
and uh, it, it makes it makes the person not want to talk anymore it makes the person just like okay yeah you, yeah. you just say what you want to say and i'll just sit back exactly exactly it doesn't become about uh about what you're saying anymore it's not yeah. about so how does that uh how do you feel uh I'm not gonna i'm not gonna be a therapist right yeah <laughs> no I, feel uh, when that happens? I i personally i personally don't care you know i would let that because the way i think about it is maybe that person wanted an opportunity to say to to say this problem yes. you know and they never yes. had a chance to yes so if they're really going to say uh if they're really going to express their feelings and say the problem then when it's happening with me i really don't mind it it's, it's okay mm. uh i'd rather them get it off their chest yes but you can tell with other people that so a lot of people get annoyed because vulnerable like we were saying earlier like you're being vulnerable in front of someone and then the other person you feel like the other person just disregarding everything you exactly, just said exactly you know even if it wasn't their intention but i mean that's just how it comes off it's it's invalidating yeah it's inv- becomes invalidating yeah so so exactly you you're vulnerable you share all these things that maybe you haven't shared with other people and yeah. then it's not even you know like we said earlier about the needs that we have you didn't feel like you were heard yeah You didn't exactly. feel like you were no anyone understood what you were going through. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't have uh I I know this might be an unpopular opinion but I don't th- I don't think a lot of people have people that are that close to them where let's say I have a problem like for example in my life if I have a problem I know there's two or three people that I can go to and they're going to listen all the way. I don't think a lot of people have that and I think that's where that problem really starts because now you're looking for an opportunity to say your problem in front of anyone you know exactly yeah. exactly exactly so so what's happening there as you're saying is you're you're filling a void yeah there's a void there that we don't have people who listen and so i'm just i'm desperate i'm going to go share with anyone and you get people um now whether they're actually listening online or not yeah. or or uh is a different story but you do get some feedback like the, like people it, it does look like people do listen yeah. online because you know you see that with the comments uh, and they have no choice they have to see the video right yeah. they have to see the whole thing and uh, and then comment uh, so you do feel like you're listened to um, so so yeah I mean do you see that as a problem then with uh, with uh, do you have you heard of stories of people telling you that that's a problem oh when yeah they're oh yeah oversharing? oh yeah like it would happen where uh it, this is this is the gathering with a couple more people it happens everyone leaves i'm left with the person that was neglected and then they're like i wasn't even able to say what uh-huh. i wanted they to say they said directly to you yeah no uh-huh. yeah they uh-huh. they were pretty open in the couple times that it did happen and yeah it's uh yeah it's a problem but you know part of it is is uh, as well as that we we can find uh, we can find those people or the friends that we that we want mm. sometimes we stick with a group of people and they're our friends and that's how we identify and then that's it i'm going yeah. they're friends for for life uh and it's not to say that you shouldn't be friends with them anymore but maybe you find uh there's a chance still to find other people who yeah. you can connect with yeah and at the same time i don't really think anyone does it with like bad intentions i don't yeah. think anyone's really like No, I don't want this person to talk. I want to yes, say my yes. story. I think it just comes off um uh, spontaneously and yes, that's just yes. how it happens. Yes, yes. We, yeah. we don't know how to listen a lot of times. Yeah, yeah, that's listen. the thing. I don't think a lot of people know how to listen. Mm. Yeah. So what what you said they're sharing when they share a point that's that's based off what you're talking about, it seems like they are listening. Yeah. That maybe that's their view is that I'm I'm showing you that I'm yeah, listening. Yeah, I'm re- I'm relating to you. I'm I'm telling you how it is from my end. Exactly. But it's not really like that. Exactly. Exactly. So I I, I think Uh, I think with some friends they might be receptive to that if you tell them. Yeah. You know, next time can you please let me finish please yeah. and, you know and then so that um if you tackle it head on sometimes it can help. So yeah. you don't feel that resentment towards that person every time you see them. Oh that's the guy who keeps cutting me off, you yeah. know. L- watch him cut me off again. Yeah. Um so th- there does become that resentment that builds I think. Uh if you don't address these things head on. Uh with some people it might not get anywhere. Yeah. But uh, you know, it might be a, it might not get anywhere. It's a lot of time. It's habitual. They're just used to it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but sometimes you can help them a little bit, guide them into what works for you. Yeah. Um, I, I, one thing I like to do is, if it happens, and then that person finishes talking, I would like 
go back to the person that was actually talking oh, oh yeah great. what that's happened great. and then just pinpoint a detail in what he was saying and so they can continue the conversation that's a good that's a really good way mm -hmm. that's a really good way because then you're teaching everyone else that by the way we talked about you but let's not forget the original yeah that he was talking first ah, or sorry. he had still a problem that he was going through and ah, so, so yeah. that's that's an amazing way yeah yeah and and that's that's kind of the way that you're doing it directly but you're not kind of being in people's face yeah i'm not trying to be mean but at the same time we can't forget what happened here Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that's a way that we can tackle a lot of problems and, mm -hmm. and you know, and, and kind of model the right way of doing things instead of just talking about it. Right. With, with our friends, family. Yeah. What's one thing, Ahmed, that we didn't talk about today that you think we should have? I think we touched on a lot of, uh, a lot of important points. I think, I think, um, the main point I think that I want to um, that I do want to focus on is is uh, that I want to mention at least I think in terms of the name of your podcast and not from here. Um, first of all, I think it's a great name, and when I saw it, and I when I, when I kind of uh, uh, I had seen your clips before, mm. but I hadn't paid attention to the name. And then when you when you uh, contacted me when you invited me, I saw the name and you mentioned the name and I said, "Well, that's a, that's perfect. That describes exactly. You know, yeah. I'm not from here, so." Um, but of course, it's it's it, you know it's literal, but it's also it's uh, there's more into it as well. Of course, so there's something deeper. Um, something I think that I we've talked we talked about today uh, is I think the idea of our humanity and and. That we're not so different from from anyone else from you know like i said i have people who sit in front of me from completely different backgrounds from different parts of the world from different types of upbringing uh, from being you know let's say in, in kind of worn torn countries or being uh, and growing up with that kind of trauma to being to, to growing up here and maybe not having all those kinds of things uh, show up for them and seeming like on the outside seeming like they have a perfect life right. no problems easy childhood easy you know all these kinds of things as described by others uh, but what I what I want to say I think is that we should you know as uh, we should be respectful of other people we should be respectful of uh, and, and empathetic to what they're going through and to what they have gone through. It's it's never good, I think, to first of all to compete for who has the most problems, right? <laughs> you think that happens a lot? It does happen. Yeah, it does happen. Um, uh, so it, sometimes it happens not the way that you'd expect it. Sometimes it happens where clients say, "I feel like I'm taking a lot of your time." There's other people who can who, who would benefit more. Yeah, who you should be benefiting more than me, and that goes to their own issue that that issue when they say that that is such a real issue for them because they feel like they're not worthy to be to take up the time that you that you're taking to talk to them yeah that someone else is more worthy to be there so no, no matter how you look at it everyone has everyone has value everyone has everyone has their own struggles that they're going through as human beings regardless of where they come from mm -hmm. Uh, different cultural beliefs, different religious beliefs should not change that, should not change how we view others, I think. I think that's one of the main things that I'm getting as I'm, I mean, as I'm getting older, as I'm talking to more people, learning from them, as I'm learning from clients and seeing clients, is that at our core, we're the same. And no matter what differences you see with someone else, um, no matter how how much let's say better you think you are than than someone else, you don't know. First of all, first of all, we don't know how Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is seeing them and us, right? We don't know. We can't make that judgment, and he can, they can be doing a lot of things that 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 um, uh, that matter more than what we're doing uh, in in the eyes of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and of maybe course. to other people as well. We don't know what they're doing behind the scenes. Of course. So that's 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 on one level, but also that. Um, that not to be quick to judge not to be sometimes we we in our community especially we get lost about um racism about you know people uh, being prejudiced against us all these kinds of things there's some dangers in that one of the dangers is having the victim and you know the victim mentality 
and feeling like we're always victims. We have that a lot. We do. Yeah. We do. So the, the victim mentality, and 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 then we, and then also the other part of it is, uh, the other part of it is, um, then we might see ourselves as being immune to doing that. When we ourselves do it, we can do it a lot. Yeah. And we can belittle other people and other. So that's why I think I think one of the big takeaways for me from everything that I've done is that uh, is valuing. Uh, you know, valuing the human being themselves because of how similar we are, I think. Yeah, with all their problems, with everything that they're going through. Yes, yes, yeah. and from whatever background they come from. That's a very that's a very important point, I think, because like you said, we, if someone comes from, from uh, emigrates here and he had just gone through war and then he's seeing someone complain about something that they see that's insignificant, they'd be like, this person just nagging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But but they are expressing themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be in a war to 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 have valid points and to right. have valid uh, feelings, right? Yeah. They, their feelings are valid regardless of where they come from. Doesn't mean that uh, an important point about validating feelings. It doesn't mean that the person's actions are necessarily acceptable or not. Mm -hmm. Like in terms of society. Um, they can be doing something illegal even, uh, but it, we're talking about the feelings. Yeah. Their feelings are valid. There's a reason that pushed them to do what they're doing. Yeah. The actions are something There's else. There's always a reason. There's always a reason. Okay. This was very enjoyable, Ahmed. Thank you so much. Thank you for me as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jafar.